So today we have kind of two small lectures instead of just one larger lecture. Um, so the first thing that we're going to be talking about is source combinations. So let's start with voltage sources in series. So let's say that I have a simple circuit like this, or I have some voltage source, so let's call it VS1 connected to some resistor over which I'm going to define a voltage drop VR, positive polarity on the left, doesn't particularly matter. And then over here on the right, I'm going to have some voltage source VS2 like so. So this simple circuit contains two voltage sources in series. If I were to apply Kirchhoff's voltage law around this single loop circuit, starting from the bottom left-hand corner and following clockwise, um, I would have the relationship negative VS1 plus VR plus VS2 is equal to zero. And I can rearrange this to find that the voltage drop across my resistor is then simply Vs1 minus Vs2, which we'll call some Vs equivalent. So I could redraw this circuit as my equivalent voltage source connected in series. Whoa, what the hell happened there? Stop scrolling on me. Here is R. And this is the VR like so. Okay. So voltage sources in series can be combined. This is something that we've actually been doing in practice anytime we've had to change the batteries in a remote control or anything like that. The way that battery packs and all that kind of stuff are wired is usually in series. Uh, the main thing that I want to point out here is that while it may look like the voltage source VS1 and the voltage source VS2 have the same polarity because both of their positive polarity terminals are on top, they are actually of opposite polarities as we went around our loop. Uh, so we saw the negative polarity terminal of VS1 first, and we saw the positive polarity terminal of VS2 first. And whenever we see opposite polarity terminals first, we wind up taking the difference of them. If we see the same polarity terminal first, then we'll add them together. So if we had something like this, where we had, say, a AA battery connected in series to another AA battery connected in series to uh, this thing right here is just a light bulb. But yep, you just made me laugh. Sorry, Ashton and I had an old electrical engineering professor that didn't say bulb, he said bub, and talked about them constantly. Um, the voltage drop across our bulb here. What the hell is going on? Sorry. Would be one and a half volts plus one and a half volts or three volts. Because we see the negative polarity terminal first. If we go uh, for both batteries, if we go clockwise, we see the positive polarity terminal first for both batteries if we go counterclockwise. So effectively, they have the exact same polarity. This also kind of explains why if we put our batteries, like one of them in backwards, one of the device usually doesn't work because the voltages wind up canceling each other out and no voltage would be applied across the bulb so that our flashlight or whatever wouldn't actually do anything. Um, 
I have never had that particular experience. Um, one of the experiences that I had when I was teaching the Engineering 120 series was people leaving the batteries in their battery pack kind of loose in their bag. And so like, I don't know if they still do this, <laughs> excuse me, but it used to be that it was until two or three weeks into the quarter that you would put your barrel jack on the battery pack so that you just had loose wires hanging out and you could accidentally short the battery pack and cause it to discharge all of its energy through that 22 gauge wire, which caused the batteries to overheat and melt the battery pack. Yeah, yeah that's, that's likely what's going on is there's a short somewhere and it's just causing the batteries to overheat. Um, because putting one of them in backwards shouldn't do all that. Right. Yeah. All right, so voltage sources in series, pretty straightforward. Anybody have any questions about this? All right, so now let's talk about voltage sources in parallel. So let's say that we have, I'm gonna use numbers here. Um, a 10 volt battery or 10 volt source here. And then some resistance here. Let's just call it R for the sake of argument. This is gonna be VR. And then we had, let's mess things up and put an eight volt battery over here. So if we were to apply Kirchhoff's voltage law around this loop, we would find that the voltage drop across our resistor is 10 volts. I'm gonna call that VR prime. If we were to apply Kirchhoff's voltage law around this loop, I'm gonna call this VR double prime, we will wind up getting VR is equal to eight volts. Anybody see the problem? How is the voltage drop across the resistor two different voltages? Another way that we could look at this is if we applied Kirchhoff's voltage law around this outside loop, we would literally see that 10 volts is supposedly equal to eight volts, which obviously cannot be true. So there's nothing physically preventing me from setting up a circuit like this. Um, but it looks like setting up a circuit like this would effectively violate the laws of physics. Since Kirchhoff's voltage law is the law of conservation of energy, uh, I'm breaking something. What is my model neglecting? The resistance of the wire, absolutely. So in any practical circuit like this, our wire, has some finite resistance that'll help take up that difference in voltage and all of that kind of stuff. Okay. So for our intents and purposes in this class, where we're assuming that all wires have zero resistance, if we ever were given a circuit like this, we literally cannot analyze it, okay? You just have to say full stop, can't do it, things are broken, not my problem, okay? Um, in practice, like I said, we can do this all day and Camden is 100% correct in that the thing that will make this work is the internal resistance of the wire kind of balancing everything out. Um, can you guys think of an application where we might see voltage sources in parallel? Do any of your parents have solar cells on their homes? Ashton has solar cells on. <laughs> All right. So a solar panel usually has a rating. So let's say that we were dealing with some small scale solar panels or something like that, right? So this solar panel might be rated for 24 volts and let's say 12 watts, meaning that the voltage drop across it 
is 24 volts and the total amount of current that's flowing through it, uh, rated current would be half an amp, right? So if we wanted to get 48 volts, we could simply wire two solar panels together and we'd wire them in series. But this series connection is still going to limit the current to half an amp. So if we ever needed more power out of our system, but we've achieved our specific voltage requirement, we would simply wire a second branch in parallel. Like so. And let's say over here we have our load resistance, which would be your home or something like that. All these are the same 24 volt, 12 watt solar panels, uh, 24 volt. And the voltage drop across our load would be 48 volts, and we could draw a maximum of one amp current by this. Thing. So we can put voltage sources in parallel to effectively boost the current carrying capability of our voltage sources. Um, I think I mentioned to you guys previously that outside of Louisiana Tech, I do some work for a company called Sabre Industries out of Bossier City, Louisiana. And for that company, I design or help to design battery energy storage systems, very, very large scale battery energy storage systems. Um, so if any of you guys have ever seen like the pictures of the big solar form uh, out in the Mojave Desert, um, me, a couple of Louisiana Tech electrical engineers uh, and some people at Sabre designed the battery energy storage system for that huge plant, $30 million project that undergrad EE students got to work on with me. Um, so in those systems, our battery energy storage system is literally just a rack full of batteries. And then we wire several racks in parallel so that we're running at a voltage of about 1500 volts, uh, but a current of about 4,000 amps so that we can feed the grid when, um, electricity is expensive off of this batteries energy storage, uh, system, and then recharge things, uh, during the day when power is relatively cheap. Yeah, or when, you know, when the sun's out and we can just let the, let everything run off of the, the grid when power is relatively cheap. So anyway, um, there are a lot of industrial applications for connecting effectively voltage sources in parallel. So for those of you that go into electrical engineering and specifically go into power systems, excuse me, power systems engineering, this is something that you're going to run into very, very regularly. All right. So now let's talk about current sources. We're going to start with current sources in parallel. So let's say that I have some current source IS1 direction up connected to some resistance R like so. And I'm going to choose my resistor current to be direction down. And then I have some current source IS2 um, also direction up. If we were to apply Kirchhoff's current law with the current flowing into the top node equal to the current flowing out of the top node, we could very easily see that our resistor current would be the combination of IS1 and IS2, which we could call ISEQ. So we could replace this circuit with an electrically equivalent circuit containing our equivalent current source connected in parallel to our resistor. like so. So in this particular example, our currents added together because our currents are flowing in the same direction, right? So they're both directed up, so they add together. 
if one of them were negative, we would wind up taking the difference of the currents. So it's a very similar situation to what we had with voltage sources in series. But now, instead of seeing if the polarities are the same, we're making sure that the directions are the same. And whenever the directions are opposite, we wind up subtracting. Okay. Um, current sources in parallel from a practical standpoint are seen a lot in integrated circuit architectures, particularly when you're dealing with things, uh, transistor circuits called current mirrors, where we can use current sources in parallel to effectively um, scale currents for various parts of the circuit, which for most of you guys means absolutely nothing right now, but for a handful of you in about a year and a half will be something that we're going to be doing quite a lot. And then lastly, we have current sources in series, and this is going to be the one that tends to break things in our simple circuit analysis. Okay. So if I had this circuit, where I have a three amp source connected to some resistance, connected to maybe a two amp source like so, if I apply Kirchhoff's current law at this node, saying the current flowing in is equal to the current flowing out, I wind up seeing that IR prime is three amps. If I apply Kirchhoff's current law at this node, I wind up seeing that IR double prime is two amps. And obviously those two currents can't be equal to each other. Right, the three amp isn't equal to two amps. Um, so if we see a situation like this, we really can't do any analysis whatsoever. We have to stop. Uh, in order for us to have two current sources in series and for us to be able to actually analyze the circuit, both of the current sources have to carry the same amount of current. Okay. Um, we are not really going to see current sources in series, well, A, ever again in this class. Uh, and for those of you that go further into electrical engineering, uh, the only time we would ever see current sources in series is when we're developing what are called cascoded uh, current sources using transistors, where we're just stacking them up together, uh, stacking transistors on top of each other to get very high amounts of current with very high output resistance, which again, I know doesn't make sense to the overwhelming majority of you right now, just trying to mention where these things are applied. Yes, John. Yeah. What do you mean, are they being separated? Right, because Kirchhoff's current law breaks. So when we applied Kirchhoff's current law here, we found that IR was three amps. When we applied Kirchhoff's current law here, we found that IR was two amps. What happens if we apply Kirchhoff's current law down here? We literally have two amps is equal to three amps, which cannot be a thing, right? So we have to have all of the, the current has to be constant through the entire loop. And it is very obviously not with this particular thing, which fundamentally breaks down our rules. Yeah. So charge is either being created or destroyed depending on how we're looking at things because the amount of current is changing in the circuit. Yeah, which is no point. All right, so these are all of our source combination things. So just to recap here, uh, voltage sources in series can be combined into a single equivalent voltage source. When the voltage sources have the same polarity, they add together. When they're of opposite polarities, they subtract from each other. Current sources in parallel can be combined into a single equivalent current source. When the directions are the same, they add together. When the directions are opposite, you take the difference. Um, if you ever see voltage sources in parallel, you need to make sure that all of the voltage drops are literally the exact same thing. If they are not, you cannot analyze the circuit using conventional circuit analysis techniques. And if you ever see current sources in series, if the current sources aren't the same thing, you also can't analyze the circuit using conventional circuit analysis techniques. Okay. So that's our first little mini lecture for today. Any questions on that before we talk about something, in my opinion, way more interesting, voltage and current division? All right.
So let us talk about voltage division first. So I want to preface this portion of our lecture um, by stating that this isn't something that you realistically have to apply. Uh, that being said, it is a tool to make your life a little bit easier in some particular instances of circuits. Um, I, I had several students ask me questions about homework set number three, problem five, I believe, where you had an equivalent resistance uh, beyond a dashed line, and then you had to find a couple of voltages and things like that. Um, and honestly, voltage division makes a problem like that very, very simple. So I might work that one as a particular example here in a moment. Okay. So voltage division is a technique that can be applied whenever we have a known voltage drop across a series combination of resistances. Okay. So I'm going to have a set of terminals here that's just part of some greater circuit. And I'm gonna say that the voltage drop right here is some known quantity, right? So we have to have a numerical value for this. Here's our resistance R1. Here's a resistance R2. And we can do this for any number of resistors connected in series. I'm going to define the voltage drop across resistor R1 with positive polarity on the left, R2 positive polarity on the left, and Rn positive polarity on top. So effectively what I'm saying is there's some amount of current leaving the positive polarity terminal of our known voltage, and it's flowing into the positive polarity terminal of all of our resistors so that everything, uh, effectively our known voltage is kind of supplying power to that resistor network. All of the resistors are absorbing power. I'm bringing your attention to this specifically because I want you to understand that the voltage VR1, VR2, and VRN are of opposite polarity to the known voltage source. Okay, That is critically important, and we're going to play around with that in a little bit. So applying Kirchhoff's voltage law, we would find that our known voltage is simply the sum of VR1 plus VR2 all the way out to VR sub n. And I can express all of these voltages in terms of that current I. So this would be I times R1 plus I times R2 all the way out to I times R sub n. For those of you that are paying attention, you might notice that so far this derivation looks literally identical to what we did on Wednesday talking about combining resistors in series. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take this one step further and say that we have I times R1 plus R2 all the way out to R sub n. And now things are going to get a little different. I'm going to solve for I. So I is going to be my known voltage drop divided by the sum of all of those resistors connected in series. I'd be willing to bet that this is a calculation that you guys have performed multiple times in this class up to this point. So where voltage division comes in is we can actually find the voltage drop across any of these resistors. So let's say resistor R1 is just going to be I times R1, which comes out as our known voltage times a ratio of resistances. So the resistor that we're trying to find the voltage drop over goes in the numerator, and then the total series resistance goes in the denominator. And so we don't actually ever need to solve explicitly for the current in order to apply 
Foltz's division. So it's just a little shortcut that can aid us in our circuit analysis. In general, the voltage drop across the kth resistor of a series combination is going to be our known voltage multiplied by R sub K divided by the sum from I is equal to one to N of R sub I, or not using this fancy summation notation, we have the known resistance, it's gonna be the known voltage times R sub K divided by REQ comma S, where that REQ comma S is just the equivalent series resistance. So let's put this into practice with something simple. So let's say that I have 10 volt source an eight ohm resistor, five ohm resistor, and the seven ohm resistor like so. And I'm interested in finding the voltage drop across the five ohm resistor with this polarity and the voltage drop across the seven ohm resistor with this polarity. So using voltage division, we could say that V5 is going to be 10 volts, which is our known voltage drop across that series combination of resistors, multiplied by 5 ohms, the resistor that we're trying to find the voltage drop over, divided by the series resistance, which is just 8 plus 5 plus 7. Um, so 8 plus 5 plus 7 is 20, so 5 over 20 is 1 fourth. 10 times 1 fourth gives me 2 and a half volts. Now for V7, we're going to do effectively the same thing, but I want us to observe something. So the 7 ohm resistor is going to be in my numerator. The series resistance is still in my nom uh, denominator. But notice that the voltage V7 is of the same polarity as our known voltage source, right? So if we were following around the path clockwise, we would see the negative polarity terminal of the 10 volt source first, and we see the negative polarity terminal of the V7 voltage first. So they're of the same polarity. Whenever our voltage drop of interest is of the same polarity as our known voltage, we need to include a negative sign. So one way that we can think about this that's maybe a little more intuitive is that if we imagine our current is leaving the positive polarity terminal of our known voltage, if it flows into the positive polarity terminal of our resistor, our voltage division equation gets a plus sign. If it flows into the negative polarity terminal of our resistor, our voltage division equation gets a negative sign. So it's following the exact same rules that Ohm's law does. So in this case, uh, excuse me, case, that would be uh, 7 20th times 10, so three and a half volts. Uh, and then we put a negative sign out front. So this is a very simple example. Let's put it into practice for something a little bit more difficult. So let's say that I have 12 volt source like so. Connected in parallel to a 10 ohm resistor. Here's a five ohm resistor. And then I'll have an eight ohm resistor connected in parallel to a 
four ohm resistor like so. And I'm interested in finding this voltage drop, which I'm going to call Vx. Now, let me ask you guys what I hope is a very obvious question. Is this network connected to our voltage source just a bunch of resistors in series? Not even a little bit, right? But we are going to kind of game the system in order to be able to apply voltage division to a circuit like this, which is more in line with what you might see on your homeworks and all of that kind of stuff. So let me ask you guys, I hope this is an easy question, but what's the voltage drop across the 10 ohm resistor? 12 volts. The 10 ohm resistor is directly in parallel with the 12 volt source. So there is a 12 volt drop across that 10 ohm resistor. So now, much like you guys had in your homework assignment, I'm gonna kind of draw a dashed line here. I know that there's 12 volt potential difference between this top node here and this bottom node here. Um, so I know that there's a 12 volt drop over whatever the equivalent resistance of that five in series with that eight in parallel with four is, right? So I can apply voltage division to this thing. Oops. By simply saying that Vx is going to be 12 volts times so the resistance that I'm trying to find the voltage drop over is eight in parallel with four. So in my numerator, I'm gonna have eight ohms times four ohms over eight ohms plus four ohms divided by the series resistance, which would be five ohms plus eight ohms times four ohms over eight ohms plus four ohms. And now I can throw this into my calculator because I can't do this in my head. So eight times four over eight plus four, five plus eight times four over eight plus four. 96 over 23 or 4.174 volts. So we just applied the concept of voltage division to this circuit, even though it didn't really contain any resistors in series, by making things look like they were series resistances, right? So why didn't the 10 ohm resistor show up in this voltage division equation? What was that, Lee? Yeah, so effectively the voltage doesn't divide over the 10 ohm resistor. All 12 volts is applied across that, right? The voltage only divides when things are connected in series to the known voltage source. The 10 ohm resistor was in parallel, so it's not going to split up. Yes. Exactly correct. Yeah, so if we were trying to find this voltage, let's call it Vy, it would be this exact same expression, except that we would replace this bit right here with just the 5 ohm resistor. So the resistance that we're trying to find the voltage drop over is always in the numerator, and the equivalent series resistance is always in the denominator. Okay. So um, I would encourage you guys to practice this a lot um, because you're gonna see me use it a whole hell of a lot. So it's probably important for it to make sense to you. John, you look like you're about to ask a question. That's fine. Um, 
I'm not entirely sure that I understand your question. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Because they're in parallel. So voltage division only works for resistors that are in series. So we need, we need to make things look like they're in series. If I combine this eight and four into a single equivalent resistance, it is then in series with that five. But it so it is across the five and the eight, but it's across the five and the eight in parallel with four. You can't neglect to observe that the four ohm resistor is in parallel with the eight ohm resistor. This again brings me back to the fact that you have to recognize that the eight and the four are in parallel in order to do this correctly. Because if you did Kirchhoff's voltage law around this thing, you would find that the voltage drop across the eight ohm resistor and the voltage drop across the four ohm resistor have to be the same thing. It means they're in parallel, they have a combined equivalent resistance, and that's what's getting plugged in here or here. So this is the exact same thing as, so here's our known voltage of 12 volts. Here's our five ohm resistor. Here is REQ. And we're just solving for the voltage drop across that equivalent resistance because we have to make it look like it's in series because voltage division literally only applies to networks containing series resistance. Any other questions? Yes, Brandon. Okay, so that's more in line with what that homework problem was. So let's take a crack at it. Okay, so let's make this 15 volts, 10 ohms, 7 ohms, 6 ohms, bless you, 11 ohms. Let's do it damn near exact, uh, identical to your homework problem, just for those of you that haven't quite finished it. And let's say that we were interested in finding this voltage, V1, and this voltage, V2 which is how the homework problem is set up. Okay. So how I would approach this particular problem is kind of how you're guided to do things. I want to find the equivalent resistance of everything to the right of this dashed line. Okay. So what is that equivalent resistance going to look like? I think it's going to be six ohms in series with the parallel combination of 11 ohms in parallel with five ohms in series with 13 ohms. So putting this in a mathematical formula, this would be six plus 11 times 
5 plus 13 over 11 plus 5, excuse me, 5 plus 13. And I'm going to go ahead and figure out what that is. 100 something? Um, six in series. Oh, you're you're just saying okay. I'm just gonna yeah. I was getting confused because I was like six in series with something in parallel with eleven is never going to be a hundred. So that's why I was very taken aback by that statement. But eleven times eighteen over eleven plus eighteen. Twelve point eight two. Uh, 8275, so let's call it 828. All right, so that's our equivalent resistance for everything to the right of that dash of green line. So I'm going to redraw this circuit where um, I'm just going to replace everything to the right of that dash green line with this equivalent resistance. So here's my 15. Here's my 10, here's my seven, here's that resistance REQ, and this is the voltage V1 that I'm looking for. Using voltage division, V1 could be given as 15 volts times 7 ohms times REQ over 7 ohms plus REQ divided by 10 ohms plus 7 ohms times REQ over 7 ohms plus REQ. So I'm just going to throw that in my calculator really quick. I've stored REQ as a variable X in my calculator to make my life easier. So it's going to look like 15 times 7X over 7 plus X and plus 7X over 7 plus X. And I got 4.676 volts. Now, since the voltage V1 is known, we can actually apply voltage division again to solve for V2, right? So V2 is going to be V1. We're finding the voltage drop across 11 in parallel with 18. So I'm going to have 11 ohms times... 13 ohms plus 5 ohms divided by 11 ohms plus 13 ohms plus 5 ohms. And then in my denominator, I have the 6 and then that same parallel resistance to the right. So that's going to look like what I have stored in my calculator is Y times, let's see, 11 times 13 plus 5 is 18, 11 plus 18, 6 plus 11 times 18, 11 plus 18. Pressing buttons too quickly in my calculator and getting input lag. 2.489 volts. Just using voltage division twice, we were able to find 
that voltage or the, the two voltages that we were looking for without having to get into too much nitty gritty, never calculating a current or anything like that. So voltage division can be a very powerful tool. Well, yeah. Because now that I know the voltage V1, so the potential difference between this node and this node is a known quantity. So I'm using this voltage. So now effectively what I see, let me redraw things here really quickly just as to kind of help explain things better. So this is the voltage V1. Here's my six ohm resistor. And then this is my 11 in parallel with five and 13. And this is the V2 that I'm trying to solve for. So I have a known voltage drop being applied across a series combination of resistors or a combination of resistors that can make it look like a series combination. Did that answer your question? Right. So that's what our known voltage is for this second stage of the circuit. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, once you know what the voltage is, it's a known voltage. That, that's literally what known voltage means. I know what it is. I'm going to ask you guys to do this then, just really quickly. Let's call this V3. How would I find V3 knowing what I already know? Elisa, are you going to answer that question or you got a different question for me? Where do you want that resistor to be? So if we had a 10 ohm resistor there, or sorry, if we had a resistor here, let's call it just R sub X. That would show up right there because that resistance is in series with this 15 volt source. So it's gonna show up there and only there. All right, how am I gonna solve for V3? given that I know V1 and V2. Yep. So tell me what the equation is going to look like, Patrick. Nailed it. We can use multiple iterations of voltage division to go further and further down the circuit and find really any voltage that we want to. Um, at a certain point, these things are going to get so complicated that we're not really going to use voltage division for it. We'll come up with other techniques like mash and nodal. This is probably the limit of what I would try to force you to do with voltage division. I'm just trying to show you that it can be a very useful tool, and it can also save you some time because you never really have to figure out what the current is. Right? So that's less calculations for you to do. All right. Any other questions about voltage division before we move on to current division? Yes, Karen. You need to combine, you need to be able to combine them first. Any other questions regarding voltage division? All right. So now let's talk about current division. Uh, and I'm going to forewarn you. I teach this significantly differently than the other professors that teach circuit one. Um, and as per usual, I'm an arrogant enough asshole to say that my way is the best way. So let's say that we have a network, part of some larger network. Where we have some amount of current, let's call this current I known. 
flowing into a network that contains multiple resistors connected in parallel. Or this will be R1. R2. All the way out to R sub N. Like so. And I am going to define my resistor currents. IR1. IR2. And IRN like so. So effectively I'm saying that my current I known is flowing into this network and then it's going to divide between these resistors and now I'm trying to figure out how it divides, right? So if my current is flowing in, then all of my resistor currents need to be flowing out. So that's the thing that I've established here. Much like we needed the voltages to be of the opposite polarity to voltage division with all positive signs, we kind of need the currents to be of opposite directions in order to make everything work out with our signs here. Okay. So since there's some amount of current flowing into this resistor network, there should be a voltage drop across my resistor network as well, but I'm just going to call V. Okay. Applying Kirchhoff's current law, I can say that I known is equal to IR1 plus IR2 all the way out to IRN. I can express all of these resistor currents in terms of our voltage V using Ohm's law. That's going to look like V divided by R1 plus V divided by R2 all the way out to V divided by R sub N. I can factor out V so that I will have one over R1 plus one over R2 all the way out to one over R sub N. And now I'm going to solve for V. So V is just going to be my known current divided by one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R sub N. This is a quick aside thing here, just because I'm gonna use this relationship in a minute to simplify things and make it look prettier. This is literally nothing more than go away that weird thing. I known times the equivalent parallel resistance, right? Because one over one over R1 plus one over R2 all the way up to one over R and sub N is just R E P for this one. So using Ohm's law, I can then say that the current flowing through resistor R1 is just V divided by R1. Or I could write it as V multiplied by 1 over R1 and substituting in my relationship for V, I will have I known times the ratio of one over R1 divided by one over R1 plus one over R2 all the way out to one over R sub N. In general, the current flowing through my kth resistor is going to be my known current times one over R sub K divided by the sum from I is equal to one to N of one over R sub I. And this can be written as I known times R E Q in parallel divided by R sub K. So we have another situation to where we can define currents without ever calling for a volt, right? Everything is expressed in terms of ratios of resistances, but with current division, we wind up 
having to deal with a recipient. Right. Now that's potentially very different from what, um, if you've taken this class before with not me, somebody else might have shown you a very different relationship. And well, we're going to get to that relationship here in just a moment. Okay. Yeah. So what happens if I just have two resistors in parallel, right? So let's say that I have some current I known splitting between some resistor R1 and some resistor R2. And let's say that I'm just interested in IR1. Using my relationship, I would have IR1 is equal to I known times one over R1 divided by one over R1 plus one over R2. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply one over R1 by R2 over R2. And I'm going to multiply one over R2 by R1 over R1. And so that's going to look like I known times one over R1 divided by R1 plus R2 divided by R1 times R2. Since I'm dividing two fractions, I can just multiply the fraction in the numerator by the reciprocal of the fraction in the denominator. And so that's going to give me I known multiplied by, I don't need that to be that large, one over R1 times R1 over R2 excuse me, R1 times R2 divided by R1 plus R2. And my R1s here cancel each other out. Leaving me with I known times R2 over R1 plus R2. So I understand fundamentally why this method is taught because it looks pretty. It's literally that simple. You don't have all of these reciprocals and all this kind of stuff to deal with. That being said, this relationship only works for exactly two resistors in parallel. And I personally find it very confusing because we're trying to find the current that's flowing through the resistor R1, but the resistor R2 winds up being in the numerator. So it's the resistor we don't want to find the current through that's in the numerator, which is exactly opposite as to how voltage division works. So I'm just giving you forewarning. You will see people do current division like this. It only works for two resistors in parallel. Um, so it's not as powerful. And you have to be very, very careful when applying this form because it works opposite the way that you would expect it to work. Okay? Nothing wrong with it. It's definitely technically right. And if you look at some of my old solutions for test problems and stuff like that, I use it, okay? Perfectly valid. I just stopped using it once I saw how confusing it was for students to try to figure out how to apply it. So I would personally prefer you to stick with this method, if at all possible, because it works for any number of resistances connected in parallel, um, and there is no ambiguity. The resistor that you're trying to find the current through is on top, and all of the resistors connected in parallel are on bottom. So it's the exact same form as our voltage division relationship, except that we're just dealing with reciprocals. All right, so let's run through some quick examples, and then I will stop yelling at you guys about stuff. So we're just going to jump straight into something that I would consider of a medium difficulty.
I want us to use current division to solve for the currents I8 and I10 in this thing. So before we even dive into this thing, we need to recognize current division is used to find out how current splits up between um, resistors that are connected in parallel. And we don't actually have a single resistor connected in parallel in this circuit. So we're going to have some shenanigans going on here, much like we had our voltage division relationships. We're going to force some things to look like parallel resistances by doing resistor combinations within the circuit. Okay? So the first question that I want to ask you guys is, what's the current flowing through the three ohm resistor? Five amps. So we know that all five amps of current flows through the three ohm resistor. None of it splits. So effectively, our three ohm resistor should not show up in any of our current division relationships because the current doesn't split, right? If all of it flows through the three ohm resistor, it shouldn't show up in our current division relationships. So from here, if we wanted to calculate the current I8, our known current is five amps. The resistor we're trying to find the current through is eight ohms. So we have one over eight ohms. And then our parallel resi or our resistances in parallel is going to look like one over eight ohms plus one over. And now we're going to have to lump together this two and this 10 so that we have a resistance in parallel with that eight ohm resistor. So this is two ohms plus 10 ohms, like so. Another thing that we need to observe is that I8 is in the wrong direction, right? So we expect the five amp current to split and some of it will flow down through the eight ohm resistor and some of it will flow to the right through the two in series with the 10. I8 is defined up, so we need to include a negative sign to correct for the fact that it's in the wrong direction. Putting this into our calculator, we're going to have negative 5 times 1 over 8. Uh, 1 over 8 plus 1 over 12. I get negative 3 amps. How would I modify this relationship? to find the current flowing through the 10 ohm resistor. Patrick. So you have, no, you're 100% you're correct. So we know five amps is flowing into the node. We know that three amps is flowing out of the node. So using Kirchhoff's current law, very obviously the current should be two amps. You're hundred percent correct, but I'm trying to teach current division. You didn't use current division. So, <laughs> yeah. So you're hundred percent right, but that's not what I was expecting. How do I modify this relationship up here to get the exact same result that we would get using KCL as you have described? Now we're just trying to find the current through two in series with 10. So it's going to be the exact same relationship, five amps, but in our numerator, we would have one over two plus 10, one over eight divided by one over two plus 10, I'm leaving off the units of ohms because it's all going to cancel each other out anyway. And then now my current I10 is flowing in the direction that I would expect it to. So I leave it with a positive sign and as Patrick correctly established, this will come out to be two minutes. Nothing wrong with falling back on KCL, KVL and all of that kind of good stuff. In fact, I highly encourage. All right, um, I think that's enough out of me. Oh, Brandon. So not all of the current flowing through the 8 ohm resistor. Okay, so let me 
you're effectively asking why didn't we do what Patrick suggested? Why don't we just apply Kirchhoff's current law? So we can't use the current flowing through the 8 ohm resistor because we have this current source in the way kind of thing, right? Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. So we need a known amount of current to divide among networks containing just resistances that are connected in parallel. But we can't use current division with this guy because some of that current's going to branch off and flow this way, hitting that current source, which is going to mess things up because it's not just a network containing resistances anymore. What Patrick suggested was that since we know 5 amps and we know the current I8, we could find the current I10. So I10 is leaving. Um, so that'll just be 5 amps plus I8 using Kirchhoff's current law, which gets us that 2 amp result actually faster. Um, but I was trying to teach current so. Um, any other questions? All right. In class assignment time, all that kind of good stuff. Anything pops up, feel free to ask.